You could do something on a personal level. You could do something on a community level. Um, this fellow did something very bad. Not to you, somebody else. You're not going to sit here. Well, this fellow did a, bad, uh, did a sin. Didn't do a mitzvah. Or he violated a mitzvah. Did something very wrong. He drove on Shabbos. He ate non-kosher. Now, a story is told about a rabbi who was walking by uh, in the street uh, by a trade restaurant. And he looked into the restaurant and he saw, lo and behold, one of the most prominent members of the shul. In fact, it's well respected and, and, and well, well loved in the shul. Man who's, who's, who, 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 who's just called for the Torah with honors every time. And then uh, he figured he's a, a, a very religious man. And he's sitting there and eating drink. The rabbi is absolutely dumbfounded. He looks at the guy and he spares out of 20 minutes and he can't handle it anymore. He walks right in and says, Yankel, Beryl. What are you doing? You didn't trade. He said, well, um, Robbie, have you been looking at me for a long time? He said, yeah, for 20 minutes. I don't feel so bad. I am the super medical supervision. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi supervised me. <laughs> I got a few laughs out of that. Yeah. <laughs> Truth is, is that um, you do, you do have to say if the person does something wrong, but then maybe he's not going to listen to you. And if he's not going to listen to you, maybe you shouldn't say. So if that's saying you're not going to go and be hypocritical and, and refuse to tell him off uh, and maintain the, 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 the anger in your heart. Um, uh, if in fact, you know, he's not going to listen to you, then you shut him out. It's not going to help. But the removal of the hatred in your heart means Let's find a legitimate reason why the guy did. Maybe there's something behind that I don't know. I saw this guy driving the shore in Chavez. I drive here, I didn't see him shore. I didn't realize, you see, that his wife was in the back seat having a baby. So therefore, you understand, he had a legitimate right to be in the car. But I didn't know that. You always got to judge people favorably. Never, never make a judgment on someone who, in fact, you don't know the real facts. Yeah. So, therefore, you can love the person, you can stop hating him in your heart, even if you don't tell them all. But the better way is to tell them all. To tell them in a way that's embarrassing. That doesn't murder him. Right? Doesn't murder, doesn't murder his soul. That's, that's, right. Right. that's right. So, let's say I want to confront you uh, on a matter, maybe, a, maybe it's a personal matter, in fact. Or maybe it's not a personal matter. Maybe it's a, 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 a traditional matter or a general matter. Either way, I have to question. I have to assume a responsibility to say something. But the question is, will I be affected? So the Jewish people are building a golden calf. Core screams and yells. Our own doesn't. And you think it's not going to help. Who got killed, by the way? Who gets killed? Yeah. Our own, because they're all they're all in a frenzy, you know. We want us golden calf. Don't you stop us? Get out of here. So they killed him. Our own says maybe maybe we'll work a, 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 a little more diplomatically. So he says to them, guess what? Um, if, if you really want to whatever you want to do this golden calf and stuff, I have an idea for you. He said to everybody, I think it's gonna win. And not, not to the women, I mean, the, uh, the men from the women. Uh, it wasn't the women that did it. I should take that back. In fact, the women were, 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 were not, not guilty. Uh, he says to the men, get all the jewelry and gold and silver that you got and bring it to me, and I'll get your golden gift. Now, he figured, I just started asking Jews for money, and instead, he figured maybe they'll be like a little bit, you know. I mean, like, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you all want to come and learn with me, it's going to cost you all $10,000, $50,000. Forget that. Uh, he's swinging, give me all your money. Give me all your money. Guess what? You're in a frenzy. They gave it to him. Didn't expect this. What well, course, something happened to me such a thing. Oh, all that money? Whoa. So he takes it and he throws it into the fire. 
Now, again, Moshe Rabbeinu chastises him for this, but the point was that you were not what? You were not on top of the situation. Right, you, you should have you told him say, right? But you can come over over here, right, right next to me. So I came on. <laughs> <laughs> and you got to see right over there. Next time, come on. Yeah, here you go. Take this. Take this. And they all take this. So basically, what we want to say is that these four mitzvahs have to be remembered as love people. And if you really love someone, you all tell them one. If you don't love the person, and you don't, if you, if you think you love him, but you won't tell him, and you don't really love them. You don't really care. Tell your children, go out and play in traffic. <laughs> you know, and you don't love your children. People who tell their children, discipline their children, love their children, but tell that to the CTA. Tell that to the 10 year old. I'm punishing you because I love you. Sooner or later, they get it. They were 18 or so, but they get it. The point is that, is that, uh, the sense of real love is in, is inputting person's lives mm-hmm. and letting them know. Uh, woman comes to the class for the first time and uh, doesn't necessarily dress properly. Dress up to take her side, explain to her, you know, with pants and attached sleeves. Because it's uh, more of a problem in the summer than it is in the winter. But, but uh, yeah, you have to, you have to say, it. you just can't, um, you know, ignore it. And that's the point of, of what I was going to say is the whole part is all about confrontation. So let's take a look at what we got to say. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, sir. How do you avoid causing resentment? Well, we said that. Try to, you have to do different factors. Again, once again, don't let you know embarrass the person. It's private, it's private. It's public, you know. It's in private, right? So, and you got to judge the person as to where he's at. When you're in a frenzy because you want a golden calf, I wouldn't say you shouldn't have a golden calf. That would be in a frenzy. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Okay, so, uh, and you see, they kill the guy over it. But the fact is, the closer the approach, the closer the connection, we had a chance for confrontation. But at the same time, the closer the chance for confrontation, the greater the chance to in fact connect and to share and to improve not only the person's life, but your relationship with him. Since our parsha is called Vaigash, this may suggest that there is more than one approach in our parsha. This is a parsha of, of approaches and confrontations. In fact, the parsha is loaded with them. I'm going to suggest 10 such approaches in a parsha, and some may be connection, some may be confrontation, some may be both. Let's figure it out. Number one, Yehuda approaches Yosef, uh, who is AKA the Viceroy of Egypt. Does Yehuda know that? Yes. Does Yehuda know that? No. Right? He knows he's the Viceroy, he doesn't know it's Yosef, right? He whispers in his ear, Indicating a very close approach to which he says. Um, and we can take a look at it in the Chumash at the same time, if you want to do that. Uh, Vayigash is on page 251. 251? Okay. Uh, where is it? 251. Okay. Um, uh, 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 Yehuda approaches him and says, if you please, my Lord, may your servant speak a word in your ears and let your anger not flare up against me. I am your servant for you are like Paro. He compares him to Paro. Now that's a pretty big honor. He speaks to him with honor. He speaks to him with respect. Okay, I hear it. Let's take a look at our page over here. Yehuda approaches Yosef. He whispers in his ear. And obviously he's whispering in his ear because he came close enough. It says in the ear. Doesn't say ear over there in a pusik. Yeah. Right? Says ear. Mm-hmm. Right? Indicating a very close approach in which he says, I respect your position of leadership as much as if you were Baro himself. Itself should say himself. That's bad. <laughs> um, however, I am desperate to save my brother. And if I have to, I'll kill you and I'll kill him as well. So what does that mean? That means, let's say, you don't like trouble. 
but they don't like Biden. So fight against him. You hate him, <coughs> but you have to respect him. He's the president of the United States. To make fun of the President of the United States is a disservice to the country. It undermines the very essence of our stability in the United States. Not the President of Biden. Fight against him. Bring up another candidate. Bring up another, you know, fight for another party. But you have to respect, you can't make fun of the president. The office. And the, the, the office, office, right, the office of the presidency, correct. So now, in, in, in so doing, he says, you're like Paro, I respect you. You're a leader. But understand something, I'm a desperate man. Why am I desperate? Well, let's put it this way. How did Yehuda, right, get through the Secret Service? How did Yehuda get through all those guards that are guarding Yosef? He must have rushed. He must have rushed. He must have rushed right through them. But somehow or another, you can almost do anything you want to do if you're desperate. If you're desperate. Desperation is a powerful, powerful emotion. And it's a, a very effective, um, uh, energetic uh, uh, thing that you can accomplish with. If you're desperate enough, you'll get it done. Yeah. Now, I'm, my brother's at stake. And uh, Yuna is desperate to save his brother. So he gets through. And he tells you, I'm a desperate man. He tells him again. They're all saying, what's he telling? What's he saying to Elijah? Why? What's he got to lose? Just kill me. Oh, it's the lose. My life ain't worth a buck nickel. If I can't bring my brother home safely to my father after I promise. Because everyone knows the story. Brothers met Paro, but met Joseph. Joseph was hard for them. Joseph said, "You want to come down and uh, and and uh, visit? Uh, you want to come down and uh, uh, and and get food? Come down again. Bring your little brother. But don't show up." He tells Yaakov, "You got to bring little brother." And no, no, no. You can't bring my little brother. I lost Joseph. I'm not going to lose him. I'm bringing him in again. Why are you so nervous? Well, frankly, he's nervous because traveling is always dangerous, no matter what. We always say a special prayer called Brother Derek. Travel's prayer. You fly in an airplane. When you say travel's prayer, you fly in an So, just about as, the, as the, uh, the, the plane picks up speed, right? Or in the air. I'm sorry, but enough speed to get into the air. Just about that moment, uh, about uh, um, uh, getting aloft. That's when you start the hero on the Paneco and you see a travel story. You're traveling on a boat. Good thing. You're traveling on a freeway, on a 405. Oh, oh, oh how many accidents you find over there? They're safer in an airplane than you're on a 405, right? Well, we don't say travel is great, 405. <laughs> you got to be outside the city limits, outside the normative of life. In the valley, you can go from one city to the other and not know the difference. From North Hollywood to Van Nuys to, uh, to, to, to uh, Encino, Tarzana, uh, Woodland Hills, Canova Park, Reseda, and blah, 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 blah. Till you finally get a break in the action somewhere down on a freeway, you see um, uh, between Calabasas and Agoura. If you're traveling and you're in Calabasas and you're on your way to Agoura, that's when you see Calabasas. Because you're outside the city limits, you're outside a, 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 your, your comfort zone, so to speak. Because there's no houses, no civilization. Same thing with an airplane in the air, a boat in the ocean. But the point is, is that travel is a dangerous thing. Yaakov realizes that. He's got two sons from his beloved wife, his beloved wife, and Yorka is dead. And he's got uh, Yosef, who's, who's, who's lost. And he's got uh, Binyamin left, the one that was born. When his beloved wife died in childhood. And um, 
He's also reluctant to go for another reason. You know, I guess. What was the question? He's also reluctant to let him go for another reason. Anybody want to guess what other reason might be? That he's reluctant to let Benjamin go with the brothers? Well, he says Yosef is dead, and if I was then well, no, no, right, right, then I will. Well, why is my, well, well, right, so we understand it. Well, why is he so nervous? Doesn't trust the kids. He doesn't trust. Oh, he doesn't trust those guys. He doesn't trust his sons. Yeah, yeah, who does? The last time I sent out my beloved Yosef, he didn't come to visit you. He didn't come back. Maybe there's foul play. Maybe there was. I don't know. But I know this much. I ain't letting. I'm, I'm not letting the younger and you with you guys. Do you, do you hear the the the, yeah. the trepidation here? Well, the suspicion. Uh, I'm suspicious. Okay, in any event, so he finally lets them go, and Yehuda swears he promises the only way I can get him to let my father go is I swear I'll bring him back. And I swear, I swear on my life. If I don't come, if he doesn't come back, I don't come back. But it's more than that. I swear on my life in this world and the next world. I will lose my eternity, my other, my ball. I will lose everything as if I've never existed. Not just being dead in this world, but dead forever. If I don't bring the So you want to send a desperation now? Yeah. He's recommended not to do this stuff. He did. He did. Now, of course, in a way, he did it because maybe he's assuming that last time it was I who suggested that we sell him. So maybe I, Yehuda, need to take a. a, a you should go over what you did before. And Shuma was the one. No, no, no. Shuma wanted to kill him. Lady wanted to kill him. Ray Hood said he's selling. Ray Ben said he's coming back. So, therefore, the confrontation is I'm desperate and it's in your ear. I'm not saying it publicly, but I'm telling you if I don't get my brother back, you're dead. I'm dead. You're dead. You blow my head off. I'll blow your head off. I'm going to I want my brother back. Because I got nothing to lose. He's demonstrating our right. group. Right. And that's that's what he promised. That and he good. said he said that word. He our said group. that he said yes. the word our group responsibility and connection. And he said that word to his father. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, let's go on to number two. Yosef reveals himself to his brothers. Now up until now, he hasn't revealed himself at all. Why don't they recognize him, everybody? He got a beard. <coughs> well. Notwithstanding, what I got a suntan too. <laughs> notwithstanding, notwithstanding the beard, we often said because we don't mind people that joke, right? People do look alike, even with beards or without beards. Oh, guys have the advantage girls don't have, you know, you grow a beard and you can't recognize, you know. But a Superman does nothing of the sort. Whereas in those days in the fifties, when Superman goes around, nobody do beards. But uh, but but but. Um, Superman puts on his pair of glasses and he becomes a man. Ridiculous. I mean, we said, right? But they realize that he is as, 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 as mild mannered as Clark Kent is in comparison to the great Superman. That's how they realize Yaakov and Yosef, that their, their baby brother, is in their eyes still a baby and couldn't possibly be the chief uh, 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 leader uh, 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 and, and viceroy of the tribe. So they don't recognize him. And he's talking to them. And your spies, bring me down your little brother. And then he puts the his goblet in the little brother's uh, uh, saddlebag, and he catches them, and he accuses him, and I'm taking Benjamin and the rest of you go by. And that's when you you look for the action. And um, for one thing, Yosef has always been trying his best. To reconcile with his brothers, he knows he's as guilty with his brothers uh, a, 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 as they were with him. Yeah, they sold him into slavery. That was dastardly, but he was provoking, arrogant, and, and arrogant, and, 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 and vain, and childish, and uh, a tail, and, and tail bearer. And and, 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 and um, he, for his part, has sat well years in prison, contemplating this to realize his mistake. That's called chuva. What is Chuva? To return back. I'm not only sorry what I did, but if it ever came up again, I would never do what he said about it. 
Yosef, having sat 12 years in prison, got the message. I will never again be vain. I'll never again be self-centered. I will never again assume I'm, boy, I, I, I'm, I'm a, a, a peachy king. In fact, uh, I want to reconcile my brothers, but my brothers will be true with too. They're part of the deal too. They sold me into slavery. They're rats. Okay? So, um, so uh, he's trying to get them, to put them in a position. What if he does this? What if he does his whole sabotage and put the set up, put, put the cup in, 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 in bring them in the bring them in the saddle bag? He wanted to get them to <coughs> and get sorry for what they did to him. They won't let it happen again to the young. So he sees, whoa, these guys are great. These guys are uh, are, are, are really good children. And, and, and he's uh, he's gonna he, he's gonna for his part, he is going to uh, to, 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 to really um to really uh, 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 say that he's uh, um uh, he, he wants to forgive them. But he's not completely convinced that they're going to choose. Why? Because they have another sin to come for, besides what they did there. There's a lesson my father does in this book. Let's look at the coach. Um, verse 2 uh, My Lord, you asked your servants, does he have a father and a brother? We said we have an old father, young child, his brother's dead, he alone left from his mother, his father loves him. I'm running through verse 21. Uh, you said to your servant, I want to bring him down, I want to see him. 22, uh, the youth cannot leave his father, his father will surely die. You said to your servants, if the youngest brother doesn't come down, you can't come back again. 24, we went out to told um, uh, our father this problem. He said, go back and get food. We said, we can't. In 25, um, unless we take the youngest brother with us. 27, the father says, you can't do this to me. Uh, in 29, he says, you're going to take him away from me. I'll, 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 I'll be, I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll die. My, 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 my whole life is filled with, with sadness and, 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 and grief. Now, verse 30. Says Yehuda. Says Yehuda. To, to, um, to Yosef, to the advice Roy. If I come to your, to my father and the youth is not with us, his soul is bound up with his soul, it will happen when he sees that the youth is missing, turn the page, he will die and your servants will have brought down the holiness of your servant, our father, to the grave. For your servant, that's me, Yehuda, took responsibility from my father. If I do not bring back them, I'll be, I'll be sinned for all time. What's all time? This world and next world. Now, therefore, verse 33, please let your servant remain instead of the youth. I'll give you, I want to be your servant forever. I want to be a slave. Let the youth go up with his brothers. And here's the key, 34. How can I go up to my father if the youth is not with me, lest I see the evil that befalls my father? Lest I see the evil that befalls my father. And now, Judah is just repenting for the second sin. What is the second sin? Joseph. He sold, he they, sold they, they all sold Joseph in the slavery. That was sin number one. What's sin number two? Say it again. You heard our father. Identify this chapter that you were to Right. You hurt our father. You didn't realize that when you hurt me, which is bad enough, you would hurt our father. You don't realize that actions that you do have lasting impact here and there and everywhere else, all over extended. You didn't realize what you were, what you're doing. And all of a sudden, he hears you who to say, I realize. I can't bring any more pain to my father. And so, 45, chapter 45, verse 1, what does Yosef do? Once the brothers have done complete shuba, complete repentance, complete sorriness for what they've done. Now Yosef can't restrain himself anymore. He stands and everyone's there. He says, everyone, get out of here. 
Remove everyone. Why? Because as he reveals himself to his brothers, what is the brothers' reaction going to be? They're going to be astonished. Be back astonished? More than that. Back it up. They're going to be <coughs> afraid. They're afraid. astonished for what? Afraid. Afraid? Afraid. Give me a better word. Embarrassed. Embarrassed. Ashamed. They don't want people around. They don't shame people in public. I'm going to tell you off right now. Big time. I don't want anyone to tell you. And all the other people around, all the secret service, all the Egyptians, all the servants, get out. I'm going to shame my brothers to the core. That's what I'm going to say is I am. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not just the, 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 the fear. It's a fear of that. It's true. It's the shame. Someone come right up to you and make sure they say, What would you do to me at school when you were 10 years old in fourth grade? Did you know what you were doing to me? So, that, my friends, is so overwhelming that not only do you want no one around, right? But more than that, you then the rabbis then say in the Gemara in the Talmud, Oil non, the Yemani, and the Yamatoha. Woe unto us on the day that we stand in front of God after 120 years. And we have to answer for what we do. Do we understand if we're ashamed in front of people, or ashamed in front of maybe our parents? All of a sudden, we're ashamed in front of Hashem. The shame is the worst, most horrific thing. And you said a moment ago, you don't want to shame anybody back until you kill a guy. You murder. And that's what he does. But he doesn't do it today. And he doesn't do it in front of other people. That's right. Right. So let's take let's look at the paper. Um Yosef reveals himself to his brothers. The brothers were shocked and could not respond. Number two, they felt as if the heavenly judgment was upon them as they faced the truth of their deed of selling Yosef away. Yosef need tries to comfort them and explain that when the brothers had sold him, he did it with Hashem's will. He embraced them all similar to his brother Benjamin, who was not part of that sale at all. All the brothers were equal in his eyes. I forgive you all. When the ten of you sold me, number 11, Big Young and my brother, the youngest one, wasn't there. So if I have nothing against him, I think have nothing against you. Yeah. And he demonstrates and, that by saying, and he close to him. That's right. And he does, that, and he does so in a comforting manner. And so when you why, do shame somebody. Why, but why Joseph didn't go back and like visit his father? Well, his father once he became, once he became by true, he yes. Because. Because, because he was afraid that maybe he would ask him what happened to him. And then he would have to tell the truth. He didn't want to tell him. He didn't want to tell him. He didn't want to shame him. He didn't want to shame him. And um, we see that once Joseph, once, once uh, uh, the, the, the family does come down to reunite in Egypt, which we'll find about a little later in the parsha here. Once they come down, uh, during the entire time that Jacob was alive, Never did tell him. In fact, he never did tell him about what they done. Um, so he was always like wondering how it is. Mm -hmm. I send my son Yosef out to talk to his brothers. He doesn't come back. They show me a, 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 a coat of men and colors that I gave him and dipped in blood, assuming that he's dead. Now I find out he's alive. Uh, who, who's, telling, who's telling the truth there? I mean, what's going on? And he'd probably approach Yosef every time and say, you know, tell, tell me what, what, what happened. You know? Yeah. Yosef made sure in those times, for the short time that Yaakov was alive in the Trium, that he was never alone with him. Yeah. So he wouldn't have to tell him the story. Because the scripture said that uh, they had to go to Yosef and say, Your father is sick. That's right. It means that he had not been That's there. correct. Absolutely true. Visiting. Very profound. That's correct. So let's take a look. Um, the news reaches Paro, number three. And he's told of Yosef's reconciliation with his brothers. 
It now becomes known to all the secret identity of this man named Sofnas Panech is really Yosef. It's out. Sofnas Panech was the name that Paro had given him once he appointed him as prime minister. What's interesting here in this confrontation is that the news reaches Paro and Paro is now confronted with this new information that this guy is really Yosef. He's Jewish. And, uh, and he um, uh, 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 has this, this family and these brothers and this whole story and everything. This is a confrontation of the sorts where Yosef, where Paro was confronted with this information that he does not handle. Well, who is this guy? Who is this guy that, 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 that can interpret the Jews properly and then gave open up the, the put away the food and saved the whole country? And then, and he's got this, this, about this, uh, the background, his family, the skeletons in the closet, so to speak. Yeah, wasn't it known that he was like a Hebrew? Correct, but no one knew that he had his, his family. The family right. Right. But once he, once it was revealed, though, the previous generation <laughs> would have known of Abraham. Well, Abraham right, correct, and and that, and, 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 and that, and that and, was worldwide. correct, and, and Avram and Paro's got to confront that too, right. he's got to confront that information. And um, he, uh, that's, that's a, a big thing for, for, uh, for Paro to have to deal with. He's dealing with a confrontation of information, realizing that, oh, wow, this has this happened over there. This reconciliation of the family. You know, my vice is, is, is at, the, at the core of all of this. Oh, how is this going to affect us all? And uh, this is an information that we need to understand that Paro is, is, is going is going to go through some some uh, I guess some some self uh, examination about well, what am I supposed to do now? So and now that are they like the Hebrews? Uh, they never really they never really uh, had a great regard for them. They had a great regard in terms of of, of Abraham early back on, uh, and they uh, didn't mess with his wife, you know. But uh, but I think that uh, he uh, his part. Uh, uh, yeah, Paro, uh, you know, has got to run the country here, and he's got this Joseph that he's adjusting, and he's got all this baggage. But also, he's got to deal with this. I mean, <clears throat> when he introduces his family to Paro, he makes sure to say to them, tell them that you are hurt, that you are right, 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 and that offends the Egyptians because the Egyptians correct. don't write names. Correct. Well, let's take a look at the, at the further conversation then. Number four. The brothers have to confront themselves. And they start, they could have easily started blaming each other. See this situation we're in now, where we're ashamed of what we had done to, to, to Yosef 22 years ago. That was your fault. No, it was your fault. No, it was your fault. No, it was your fault. And everyone's starting to blame each other, you know. And uh, they and they and, and they could have done that because he tells them to go back to Mitzrayim, right? He tells them to go, go back to Israel now and bring father down. Yeah. So while they're on the trip, they could easily engage in this in this finger point, you know. And um, what happens? Uh, Yosef cautions them: don't do it. Do not engage in any deep or blameful discussions. It will produce no value. Let it go. It's been done. So again. In terms of confrontation, Yehuda's desperation leads to a reconciliation between the brothers, very shameful confrontation, obviously, but, and Paro's got to deal with this, everyone is shaking all over the country, but the brothers themselves have to deal with themselves. The last thing you want to do is start blaming each other. If there's going to be a collective guilt or whatever will come out of this, the last thing you want to do and start blaming. So, number five, the brothers, and here's the big holy moly. Uh, this is heavy, folks. The brothers <laughs> <coughs> approach their father, Yaakov, and they say, Yosef is still alive. And in fact, he's the viceroy of Egypt. What's Yaakov's reaction to this confrontation? I don't believe it. You are liars before you're liars now. You have with you a, um, how can I say it, a, a, a established pattern of deceit. You're liars. And uh, they just don't know how to deal with this. This confrontation is really tough. 
And they're going through misery, misery, misery. For as bad as it is to abduct your brother, send your brother into slavery, kidnaps a human being, especially your brother, that's how horrific it is to suffer the consequences once you found out. And so um, all of a sudden, they look at, Yaakov looks at wagons that Yosef sent to bring his father and brother back. And that was a secret sign that only he and his father would know. Yaakov realized that Yosef was still alive. What about those wagons? So the word wagons in Hebrew is agala. The word agala can also mean agel, which means, um, which means a, 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 a cap or a cap, right? Right? And uh, an egla rufa. They were, the, the Yosef, uh, while he was a young lad of 17, with his father, was having these great personal one on one relationship learnings. That Yosef did, Yaakov did not have with the others. But Yaakov had with Yosef one on one, and all of a sudden, in this one on one, the last piece of learning that they learned was the law of the, of the calf whose neck was broken. Egla rufa. Why was that so? Because there was a whole situation. I mean, we learned it back in the, in the fifth book of the Torah, much later on, and that there's a law that you have to do this with a calf as a sacrifice for the fact that a person died in the middle of two towns, let's say Calabasas and, uh, and Agora, and he's smacked out in the middle. And um, uh, the question is, uh, who, who's, guilty for, who's guilty for this poor guy's death? Is it the city that let him out? without safety, without food, let's say, or the city that is going to that did not bring out the escort to bring him into the city. Wherever he's closest to, that's the city that assumes responsibility. And that city would um, would, would have to uh, uh, go through this, this procedure. And um, in a way, it's a description of, of the situation here. Who's responsible for Yosef's abduction for 23 years? But the only Two people in the world that knew that they were discussing this topic was Yaakov, father, and Yosef's son. He sends the wagons, but you're a reminder of that. Right? These brothers could not know that. That's a definite proof that Yosef is alive. And so in the confrontation that he has with his sons, in which he calls them liars, he doesn't believe them, he also confronts himself. And he confronts the realization that his son is still alive because that's the proof. But it's a bigger proof. It's not just a proof that he remembers that that, that was the old, the old people remember that topic. How would you remember the same topic after 17 years, after 22 years? <laughs> 22 years ago, I saw you 22 years ago. And guess what? I remember exactly what we were discussing 22 years ago. I don't remember that yesterday. But that was. But that was Torah law after Mount Sinai. Right, but, but, they, but, they, but that was but our ancestors. Our ancestors didn't discuss it. Yeah. Our ancestors didn't learn it. They were engaged in learning, and and, and all of the what, all the mitzvahs of the Torah, and even those who did, didn't How did Yaakov do the Torah law? Because they all know the Torah. Because you know, and they all did it to a prophetic vision. Our ancestors are our our ancestors are held to have known the entire Torah. And discussed it and observed it to the best of their ability uh, at the Shem, time. Long Shem, before Shem, 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 Shem and Ever. Okay, they knew it too. But Hashem, Not as much, though. But Hashem says in His Word that Abraham has kept by command. Correct. By me. Correct. But, my, but, 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 but again, oh, he kept it before. The but we also know that they kept them as a volunteers. Yes. They weren't really obligated because they haven't been given yet. Right. But okay. Hashem didn't reveal it to them before it was given. At well. Let's, let's say the revel revelation was a prophetic revelation given only to them in which they had a proceeding. Yes. Okay. So here they are discussing this law. And guess what? Yosef remembers it. Maybe you do. Maybe you do remember what happened when you were 17. I remember a few points of 17. I'm not sure I want to tell you about them. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, I remember a few. Uh, Things I did at 17. Uh, you know, graffiti up you know, over there, graffiti over there. Still there. Still there. <laughs> my name's on it. My name's on it. That's right. They advertise with billboards and you know, all your faces and stuff. Oh, that's terrible. 
Anyway, truth is, is that what? Is that he remembered the learning after 22 years. But more than that, that he remembered learning at all. After 22 years of being away from Jewish learning, Jewish neighborhood, Jewish life, and your father, and your teachings, and all your brought for you, he remember. How many people did I meet in my life? Not hundreds, thousands. Jewish people. Jewish boys and girls that went to early, that went to a school in the, the Learn Torah in their early youth. Maybe they went to an Hebrew day school or to a high school and they were taught by great rabbis. And 10 years later, they can't read Hebrew. No purpose. I guess so. They didn't practice, whatever. 10 years later, not, they don't even know that it's Friday night. They thought it was Thursday. Much less I can't or, or, or make you sure or whatever. That's what happens when you when, when you lose touch. How did Yosef, in the midst of the most despicable country in the world, Egypt, impurities and depravities and ill behavior, and a, and, and a boss's wife come and ask you, remember to remain faithful to his heritage, his father's teachings, and remember that father's teaching 22 years later. Yeah, and remember the specific thing. He had to be practicing. He had to be, he had to be. yeah. He, he just never, never gave up. He never gave up because he said, I am going to remain loyal to my faith. So when this woman did tempt him, and he really was very tempted, right? What stopped him from indulging in that terrible, terrible sin? He says to her, is how can I sin against my right. great sin against my master and Hashem? That's right. So that means oh, that okay, one more what's up? Okay, what is up? Is up. You know me, me. Michael had a kind of funny. Michael, Tom, I'm sorry, Michael had a kind of funny. Right, very, very exciting relationship, you know. Uh, he saw a picture of his father. I'm not ready to do something absolutely terrible, disgusting. And I see a picture of my father right in front of my face. And he runs. He doesn't walk out from the woman, he runs out from the woman. Because if he walks, he'll stay. And she pulls his jacket. Yeah. There's going to be evidence against him. Yeah. He should have run back and got that jacket. You know, why didn't he do that? Because if he would have ran back and got that jacket, he would have, he would have never forgotten that jacket. He would have said, he done what he should, but he shouldn't do it. You understand? So therefore, somehow or another, even to 12 years of prison and seven years of leadership, he's now the boss of Mitzrayim, you understand? That could, that could really take you away from the Judaism. Imagine, if you're in prison, you're suffering, you think you're holding on to God. Now you're a big shot, you're Paro's assistant, you're seven years leadership in the trying of the seven good years before the good the bad years start. How much easier can we go to your head? Forget about God, forget about mitzvahs, forget about right and wrong, forget about your parents, your father, your teachings, your mother. How easy is it? Arrogance. Sometimes prosperity, success yeah. is more dangerous than suffering in terms of losing your connection. Suffering does bring you a new connection, really. But success, oh, 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 that makes it so easy to lose your connection and forget it. And so at the end of the day, I mean, what happens if is that Paro uh, is that uh, uh, Yosef does remember, and his father says, I am sure that Yosef is alive because of his, of his wagons. But more important, I know that Yosef is also still religious. Didn't give up, he didn't give up, because he wouldn't have remembered this. In other words, my joy in Yosef being alive would not have been complete. 
If I knew he was alive, but not religious. Yeah. If I knew that he was alive but abandoned, okay, thank God he's alive. Rabbi, but it, man was uh, dead. So, so Joseph was of the uh, Hebrew tra traditions in Egypt. Yeah, he did whatever he did. Yeah, he did whatever. Listen, there are heroic stories of rabbis who try to keep the religion in a concentration camps in a, in the, in the, in the Holocaust. One rabbi, I think it was the sons of rabbi. He looked at the calendar and he saw that today was Simcha's Tov. Age of holiday. What are you supposed to do, Simcha's Tov? How could you say the jury? What are you supposed to do? Dance or dance? Dance! How can you dance in the concentration camp? So he went into his bunk after he finished his work and he sat down. And he began to move his feet in simple stuff. He went to rejoice because of the people who traditional life. Sitting like this, <laughs> just moving his legs. Sim Kastoga, Sim Kastoga. Could you see that? I'm keeping the Torah alive. I'm keeping the tradition alive. I can't do much more. I wish I could dance, but I can't. I wish I was the Torah to dance with. I don't know. And it was, look at the calendar, and it's Hanukkah. Anybody have a candle? Well, if we light the candle, those Nazi gods will come in and destroy the candle and destroy us. Somehow or another, heroic, and there's books out there that tell you these stories. And they're true stories of heroic heroism to keep the tradition alive, where they're Jewish and they're proud to be Jewish for as much as they make it suffer. And they found a way to light a Hanukkah candle in the concentration. That's what this new circumcision free. And you have this sense of of um, of, of, of uh, being able to maintain. Now, if let's say a person goes through the Holocaust and comes out more religious, that's a tragedy. Say, on the other hand, um, you can't judge them. Fuck you, cross have a I don't know what we would do in those circumstances. I'm not saying that. But for those that came out and maintained and kept and grew and developed in the freedom shores of America, there was a great town called Tells. Tells was a yeshiva that was known far and wide for its uh, illustrious tradition and its, its incredible scholarship. And the intensity of its prayers. What do Yeshiva tell us? Yes. They read canvas themselves in Cleveland, Ohio. Somewhere around my bar mitzvah, I said to my father, the Blessed Mary, I'd like to go away for school in the ninth grade to Cleveland. I want to go to tell us. Tells have been reestablished in Cleveland. And I went there. And I, I was a great year for me. So I opened my, 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 my mind and, and thoughts to, to learning and to the joy of, of, of being religious. And uh, it was a great experience. And, uh, and we looked up and we looked at the, at, the, at the wall of rabbis in the front. There must have been five rabbis from over there and five over there. Each of the 10 leading rabbis of the school. Uh, there wasn't any one rabbi, it was 10 of them. He taught the ninth grade, he taught the best grade, he taught the other and so forth. He taught post high school. And um, then it was, of course, the big chair for the Rosh Yeshiva, the head. Rabbi Chaim Mordechai Katz, the model, is what we used to call him. The model came to America to try and raise funds to save the Jews and get them out of Tel's Lithuania. But before he could, the Nazis came in and destroyed the whole town. And the issue. Killed his wife and ten children. Yes, and then, for certain, why are religious anymore? He not only maintained his religious commitment, he maintained his leadership and started, we're going to build again. And we're going to build a new Tells in Cleveland, Ohio. And bring students in to learn. I look at 
this man. And he was a frightening looking man. And his beard was down here. Uh, flowing like beard. And very, very, uh, very, very uh, powerful in his, in his lectures, but very gentle in his one on one with people. How do you, how do you, how do you maintain yeah. sanity? He's committed to our sin still through all this. And so we understand that Yosef's ability to maintain his loyalty to his tradition was able to not only withstand the Egyptian suffering that he went through, but more importantly, it brought joy to his father. My son lives and he is not abandoned the tradition. And so this confrontation number five was a big one all the way around. Um, uh, please, a question. If Yosef, no, because Yosef is keeping observing, can Abba please bring down for us and teach us what he ate and whether or not he said a bracha in uh, that environment? Okay, so A, I don't know what he ate. Uh, I don't know of any sources that say what he ate. I would assume that he kept as much kosher diet, fruits and veggies, whatever. Um, Prison. Does he have any say over which is being yeah, given? What, 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 whatever it is, however he managed. I think what's important to realize that in terms of a brock up, uh, we, have, we, we are used to saying brock is everything we eat because that's a mitzvah with Rabbana. And this, of course, way before the Bermuda and the Pima gave the mitzvah. But the rabbis, we say, our ancestors kept it anyway. So whatever the bracha was, however, he acknowledged Hashem's presence in his life, he goes over every animal thing he's done. But even in the presence of Phil. Uh, well, he turned away. Maybe he put a Bible over the other things. Uh, I mean, uh, walking down the street and you see a uh, door dirt, you got to stop the prayers if you get touch with the door. Saying prayers while you're walking, you say, and you gotta stop because you see, the, 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 you know, uh, something of, of ugliness. So, of course, we have the uh, the sense of, of 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 a continuous loyalty, and uh, this brings Yaakov untold joy. Right. Yeah, <clears throat> well, couldn't we say also to that <clears throat> Yaakov had to confront within himself, correct, of hoping again, because you know, I don't know if the hope is a fair thing to say because remember. I mean, hoping again because he says because he, he, he so refused to even, be comforted. With right, right, right. Yosef. even though he did not accept fully that Yosef was dead, even though he had hope, hope and hope that he was alive. <clears throat> he had to but that, but, right, but not here. Not now. Not no, at the point. Not here. When the when brothers come back from Egypt, the last thing on his mind is Yosef. Right. And they come up with this Yosef still alive in Egypt. He thinks it's a malarkey. It's, yeah, it's and that's, that's what he's saying. That's the point of confrontation that he has to do with himself. Only if he sees the wings. Right. That's when the confrontation goes on. Right. And that's when the self evident truth becomes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Number six. Biggie. Confrontation with Hashem. Hashem appears to Yaakov and assures him that his descent into Egypt is the right thing to do and the fulfillment of the prophecy of Armadim. Yaakov's rejoicing over son Yosef allows the screen of Hashem to come upon him. In other words, for the last 22 years, Yosef, Yaakov is filled with sadness. I have a son with him. But his son is dead, maybe. During those 22 years, there is no recording at all of Hashem. Of all of a sudden, the brothers come back. He sees the wagons. He knows that Yosef is still alive. His rejoicing, uh, uh, he starts to rejoice. And guess what? The moment he starts to rejoice, he connects with Hashem. Rabbi teach us, you can never connect to Hashem in sadness. You can only connect to Hashem with joy. So if you really are in a tough spot and maybe frightened or upset or angry or whatever, Praying to God, see God. What is coming? You've got to build yourself up to a point where you sense that I accept the, 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 the presence of Hashem to the extent that it will not affect my, my, my emotions. It's a heavy test. 
I will try my best not to be upset. I will try my best not to be sad. I will try my best to handle the situation. I'm not going to blow it. So but Yaakov did not do it. 22 years, he could have prayed very hard. He didn't do it. I think, I think the issue is not that he didn't pray for it. He couldn't pray for it because he was in that kind of, that kind of stage. No. So therefore, the moment he gets into a stage where he can somehow sense a recovery from the grief, he right. prays from the chair. Our job, Yosef, what Yaakov is teaching us, is that when you're in a situation like that, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't lose it. And so the confrontation is rejoicing with Hashem. But the Hashem gives in this message and tells him to go to Egypt, meaning to say that maybe I shouldn't go to Egypt. Yeah, I know my son's alive. Yeah, I know I'm rejoicing that he's religious, but I'm not sure I should go. Wow. Until I get oh, shit. I gotta get the directive. I gotta know for sure that's right. Shem tells him, this is the prophecy that I gave my grandma your grandfather. He tells him that it's right. For the people to become a people and go through slavery and come out with, 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 the, with the great departure of giving you the And so therefore he tells him to go. Number seven, Yako, ho, 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 ho. Hollywood not capture this, couldn't capture this drama if they spent if they stood on their head and spit nickels. There's no way Hollywood could ever capture this. Yaakov and Yosef meet and embrace. He comes down to Egypt and he sees his son who he hasn't seen for 22 years. Two years. And it's a drama. And unfolds. Yosef cries and kisses his father. And Yaakov starts to say Shema Yisrael. Couldn't say Shema Yisrael 10 minutes later. <laughs> Why now? This joyous day, Yaakov realized was thanks to Hashem. And he recognized it as an expression of Hashem's complete control of the world. All occasions, happiness here require a person, a person to acknowledge Hashem, say a bracha. Realize that the great moments once you pronounce Hashem's oneness in the Shema, such as the custom in Israel, that a father recites the Shema, the verse of a newborn son. When you are ready to appreciate um, this, this, this moment, um, you're ready to, to sense the, uh, the excitement and the joy the greatness of thankfulness for Hashem should be the overriding emotion. The other day, is really beautiful, great, terrific, exciting. It just got It just got <sighs> What do you do? Now a good time. No, you say, thank you, Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. That's what you do. It's all, 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 it's Sad ones, including the happy ones. This is a happy one. Channel to Hashem. How easy is it to get Hashem things that are just great, wonderful, exciting, tremendous? Who is my God? <laughs> Think about Hashem. This couldn't happen without it. It could not happen without it. So then you get an idea of this excitement of confrontation between Yaakov and you see, after 22 years, there's hugging, there's kissing, there's crying, and there's thank you, Hashem. Shema Yisrael. Knowledge. It's not like the truth, the way this all came about. How is it? And so, this is really a great drama, and uh, the drama must, must. Um, and by the way, the reason we know this to be true is because when the Torah writes it in the Chumash, it writes that Yosef cries and kisses and doesn't say Yaakov does. 
And the reason it doesn't say Yaakov is because Yaakov is busy saying this. And that's the moment to do it. That's the moment. So here we go. Number eight. Paro meets Yaakov. Anxious to meet the man whose son saved the country. I heard your father came down to town. I sure would like to meet your father. Yaakov, let's take a look. Yaakov admits to Paro that his life has been hard, troubling, and difficult. For this, he will be punished. That was wrong thing for him to do. Um, still, it is Paro who seeks Yaakov's blessing, not the other way around. So Yaakov, he, said he said the wrong thing? Yeah. He shouldn't say that? Right, that's correct. Mm -hmm. But Yaakov does not seek Paro's blessing. I do not need Trump's blessing. I don't need Biden's blessing. I don't need anybody's blessing. I certainly don't need the Prime Minister of Israel's blessing. I don't need any of those guys. Prime Minister Menachem Begin comes to America. There's no solution for the Bible Shulam. The Rebbe. I'm the Prime Minister of the country. You'll visit the Rebbe. The Rebbe's not coming to you. You hear that? You hear that? And that, that's what happened. That's the truth. And there were some secular Israelis didn't like it too much. Going to the Rebbe, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't look good. You're very religious, whatever. I understand, said Megan. The success that I enjoy in my administration is going to be directly dependent upon God's blessing. I need you, Rebbe. I need God's blessing. I need God's blessing to steward the country for the next four years. That way we'll have peace and freedom from terrorism and from war and from an attack from hostile enemies. The kind of protection that the idea cannot provide. It does its job. The idea cannot protect me. <clears throat> now, this connection is that the Holy Tzaddik is there no need for a leader or politician's bracha? Living your life with the Shem is the greatest protection and greatest fortune of all. No human being can provide that. The great king of Egypt, however, and other leaders of all countries are in need of the blessing of Hashem through a holy and righteous man. Yaakov blesses Paro and the five remaining years of the famine end immediately. Guess what? There were supposed to be seven good years and seven bad years, right? Yes. And we all know that that the um, that Yosef was 17 years old when he got sold into slavery, right? Yes. And we all know that he spent 12 years in prison. One year before he got into trouble with that woman, and then 12 years in prison. And now he's 17 plus 13, he's now 30, right? Yes. And nothing happened to the first seven years because it's all good. He's now 37. Says the, the Torah, two years later, the brothers come. And he says to them, come on and come on down to Egypt. He's 39. If he left at 17 and he's now 39, he was away from his father 22 years. Correct? Okay. So now there's five more years to the famine. And guess what? Cut short. Cut short. <laughs> Yaakov blesses Paro and the five years of famine. Bam! And that's a power that even Yosef didn't have. Yosef can only come up with the idea of interpreting the dream, selling, telling them that power is a problem, and finding a solution called. Store away the food and seven good years. Yeah, no. end it. Yeah, <laughs> on the spot. Okay, you had a power to tell it? You had a power? Yes. And so, the, obviously, uh, the power was obviously impressed with So, it so, well, it was bad that he did this power? Yeah, it saved the, saved the tribe. Whoa. Saved the tribe for five years. They were both of the family. That didn't end up for family. Yeah. So Paro's dream of the seven and seven was more of a dream, like not a, not a prophecy, right? Which is why I no, it wasn't prophecy, but prophecy can also be upended. How many times were prophets coming to the Jewish people throughout the years of the, in the when they were in Israel saying, and then you're going to the prophets of doom, Hashem is going to kick you out of Israel, and then make something to destroy the Shu Chuba. And then the Shu Chuba, and Hashem relented and said, let's try again. In other words, even though the prophecy is there. Things can upend it. Right. Things can change it. If you do chuba, mm -hmm. if Hashem has more mercy, gives you more time. That's true with Yonah and Assyria. Correct. Yonah. Correct. And that's true with the Hanukkah. And then, After the Hanukkah celebration, uh, the, the temple stood another 200 years. During those last 200 years, the temple standing, by the way, were corrupt years. Those were not good years of 
of leadership and proper Kohanim and proper kings uh, at the time in biblical Israel. Um, and that's why the ultimately the temple, the second temple was destroyed. It's important to realize that um, that um, king becomes a king. President becomes a president because of the great personal desire. What's the desire? What's he Why does a man run for president? Why does a man run for Congress or run for this or run for that? Why does a man want to want this for? I mean, a better job? Power, absolutely power. Power is one of the greatest pleasures of all time. And the loss, scale of five pleasures, pleasure the number. Two, except it's one of the difficulty. When you think you've got power, that's when the Almighty controls it. Every single decision that a leader makes is forced by a chef. Is it because he's responsible for other people? Uh, correct. But, but again, the idea of a chef controlling a king is laid the law can be on a chef. The part of the king in the hands of Hashem. Hashem will do an order so it needs to be done for the world through you, which means you lose your freedom of choice. You don't have the power, now you lost the whole power of yourself. What a, what, what, what a, what a dumb job. Yes, sir. The greatest pleasure of all, greater than power, is the power of connecting with Hashem and unifying with Him to exert the greatest power of all in terms of bringing the two. And that is what uh, is, is what Paro sought from Yaakov. Number nine, the people of Egypt approach Yosef, desperate for food. They no longer have money and money to pay. Big confrontation here. Yosef, in his loyalty to Paro in Egypt, requires all the citizens to pledge their possessions and themselves in service to Paro, which means that they'll become slaves. They control nothing anymore. And it becomes a communistic state. Uh, and that's exactly the power that Yosef entrusted into Paro. Uh, why did he do that? Because of his loyalty to the people, or loyalty to the country. In other words, when you're there, and you're in a, in a foreign country, such as we are today, uh, we need to be loyal to our country, and loyal to our laws, loyal citizens to our, to our, uh, to our, to, to American ideals. Uh, some stupid guy, football player, they played a national anthem. Sorry, but the American player, you know, I'm going to do That's some of the Jewish people should do this. Jewish people are going to love them. Um, but maybe we are going to change in that. We remain loyal to the original king of the United States. So he did that, he kind of us, he had a kingdom of kindness. He prospered him more than ever before anyone else did, except for Spain back in 1492. And uh, he had to remain loyal. So that's why Yosef tells the people to remain in loyalty to the country. Paro's respect for the priests of Egypt is manifested by the fact that the community of Kohanim were not taxed in any way. Anyone else was, but not Kohanim. Even their own Kohanim, their own priests have to be respected. Paro shows that there must be secular respect for religious people. The religious and personal dependence are guaranteed by the esteem in which the government and the population hold them. If the government and the population hold religious people in esteem, then their religious blessing comes upon the country and success. When you've got liberals that are trying to do away with God and do away with uh, the, the proper teaching in public schools for the children, eroding perhaps the 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 the, the uh, foundation. foundation of the United States. United States in trouble. Country in trouble. We have to stand for our principles, uh, and they may not necessarily be coinciding with liberals who uh, uh, have an agenda of undermining the foundation of the country. Those foundations are the foundation that came to safety in the first place, and we need to be loyal to that. And so this confrontation. With Yaakov, with Yosef, with Paro, and his own priests demonstrate respect and esteem. That's a confrontation that does connect you, that does bring you closer, um, but it's a, a, it's, it's a connection. 
in which the method of connection is called respect and esteem. One of the best ways to confront people is with respect and desire. And uh, recognizing each one's respect and value. I'm the political leader on Paro. But I respect what you represent in the country, the religious leadership, the religious power. And therefore, in that sense, um, I exalt you and make you free to pay back. So uh, that is a sense of confrontation and connection as well. Anyway, so we're out of time. And uh, uh, um, uh, what I wanted to say are a couple of points. Number one, please take this home. It's a gift. It's a personal gift. I wrote this up myself. Uh, I, I worked this out. This is a couple of years in the making. Uh, and trying to learn about how to interact on a really close connection. Close connections aren't to be afraid of. Uh, we shouldn't be afraid of confrontations either. But we need to know how to do them and how to work them out. Uh, there is no class on Sunday. I'll be out of town. Um, I do want to remind everyone, however, that there is a fast day on Tuesday. It's called the 10th of the month of today. It's in honor of the, or memory of the, uh, see the beginning of the siege of the Babylonians, Babylonians against uh, the Jewish people in Israel and led to the destruction of the first temple, the first place of the doctrine. And so uh, this was uh, done by the evil king, Nebuchadnezzar. And you, uh, the fast starts in the morning, not at night before. Uh, the fast is only a prohibition of eating and drinking. It has nothing to do with any of the other prohibitions of Yom Kippur. It is a rabbinical fast. It is a, it is a lenient fast. If you're not feeling well, you may break it. Uh, however, it's a short fast. Um, the short fast is uh, the fact that um, th that uh, it starts, uh, the, 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 the sun rises at seven. So uh, the, the, the rise of the dawn is about 72 minutes before, which is 10 to, 10, 10, 10 to, to six. So you can eat breakfast if you want at 5.30. Yeah. Because the night doesn't end till the rise of the dawn. The rise of the dawn is 72 minutes before the sunrise. Seven is the rise of the dawn is at 10 to 6. And sunrise is at 7. So uh, therefore, you can eat breakfast at 5 a.m. or 5.30, uh, or even 6 to 6.30 or whatever. Uh, the fast ends as when the stars come out 20 minutes after the sunset. Sunset these days is about 4.50. So 20 minutes later is about 5.10. The fast lasts from about 6 to 5, about 11 hours. Not a very heavy, a, a, a difficult thing to do. Uh, there are special prayers in the shul on that day. And, um, uh, and the men should try to go and, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and uh, participate in those prayers. Uh, especially some of the prayers are even uh, reminiscent of Rosh Hashanah and the Kippur. I would also say that um, uh, women need to be uh, very, uh, uh, should be lenient, particularly pregnant women, nursing women, uh, anyone uh, in the slightest way is feeling uh, not 100%, uh, there's every reason and allowance to break the fast if you have to. Uh, I would also like to uh, welcome back uh, Yael, I haven't seen you in such a long time, warms my heart, almost gave me another, uh... <laughs> but it was joyous to see you. Simcha, and also to uh, Russia Mazel Tov to Hanna McGraw.